All right, well, let's call the Burlington Development Review Board uh, meeting for November 1st, 2022 to order. We have a quorum and I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, our agenda tonight is posted and Scott, I think the only potential change is that Hungerford Terrace has asked to defer the application to consider further revisions and they didn't ask for a date certain. Do I have that right? You have it right, except that as of today, I'd like to go with December 6th for a date certain continuance. How does our December 6th look? Uh, there is room for it. So moved. So moved. Second. Chase, all those in favor? All right, that one's out. So we'll proceed through our public hearing. There are communications that are posted online uh, that we all take into consideration and the minutes of the meeting, if any DRB members have changes to those, please get them to Mr. LaCava and the rest of us um, because I've learned I need to sign them more quickly. So <laughs> I'll do that. Um, so the first item for public hearing is 217 Star Farm Road, ZP22540, establishment of a cannabis home occupation business. Um, before we start, I'd like to get everybody who's going to testify on this to raise their right hand so I can administer an oath. Scott, do you want to promote the applicant, actually? I was waiting for hands to go up for folks who are looking to testify. Nobody's raising their hand, and I don't see any Kenneth Dahl in the attendees. Okay. Let's, let's put it this way. If you're the applicant, could you raise your hand? Name, raise your hand. Oh, there we go. It's under a different name. Okay. Hello, am I on this? Yep. Yes, you can hear me? Can it yes. all here? Okay. Yeah. I, I don't see myself or anything, but as long yeah, as you can we hear don't, me. We don't have our videos on for okay. testimony on the panelists. So uh, anyway, I'll do it this way. Can you raise your right hand, please? Yes, I'm raising it. to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So we have in front of you, in front of us, your application for the establishment of a home occupation, small scale indoor cannabis cultivation. Um, just briefly describe your project and what you'd like to do to us. Do please describe it to us. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, in short, that's it, it is a small scale cannabis cultivation operation. I will only be using a fraction of the potential tier one uh, thousand square feet canopy that would be allowed by that licensing, uh, 150 square feet. Um, I will be growing, cultivating the cannabis in my basement, drying it down there, packaging it and selling it to either uh, directly to retail establishments or, or possibly a, a other licensed retail establishments or other licensed wholesalers um, or licensed manufacturers, just depending on what is available for me, uh, you know, and what, how the market plays out and like, who wants to buy what I have to offer. Um, as I move forward, I do hope to grow the business um, and move out of the house and into a more professional uh, facility that would be allow me to, ma to do the maximum canopy for my license tier and grow the business uh, more seriously. Are you going to have, um, tell us about the electronics you'll have. Yeah, so uh, I'll be growing uh, in what they call grow tents, which are kind of self-contained systems. I have, uh, reflective materials they're basically like a room within a room and um, they can um, support um, 
the tents that I'm going to use will support two lights, the LED uh, grow lights. They are the most uh, efficient uh, in terms of electrical use, and they also are the uh, least um, kind of grow light that produces the least amount of heat. So really, for me, they're about the only option um, in this um, scenario of growing in grow tents. Um, I, I think it, what I know about the industry is LEDs are the way that everyone will go anyway. But uh, so each light will draw approximately, uh, depending on what brand I end up, I don't have them purchased yet, but depending on the brand, um, the lights will be drawing anywhere from like 400 to 600 watts each. Um, and then as far as other electronics, like, so each tent will have two lights. Each tent will have an inline fan and an inline fan is the fan that um, kind of sucks the air out and scrubs it as well. So that fan's attached to a filter, a carbon filter. And uh, those filters do two things. Well, they do kill older, but they also help clean the air of contaminants. So they're essential uh, whether I was trying to kill the odor or not. I mean, at least in terms of producing a, a good product for sale. Um, so those fans, you know, they're just like a, a normal fan. We're talking about like 50, 100 watts. Then each tent will also have a couple small clip-on uh, fans that will do like circulation of the air. And they're just small, they're like a desk size fan. Uh, they'll clip onto the structure of the tent and just move the air around uh, to keep it from getting stagnant. And then the room itself, not, not in the tent, but the, the room at my basement, uh, I'll have a dehumidifier. And we're just talking about like a normal household dehumidifier, something you would find in any basement. And that's just gonna take the moisture out of the air uh, that might accumulate as the, the plants respirate. And, uh, you know, I'll just be dumping it kind of like you would at home, you know, take the bucket out once a day, dump it in the, in the tub or something. And um, that would, as far as electronics, that really covers it. Um, I, because of the size of the operation, I don't need to do air conditioning units. Um, the size of the basement and given that it's uh, underground provide enough cooling for me to get by. Um, this really is like just kind of a stepping stone. Hopefully the less time I'm down in my basement, the better for me. Um, but uh, so maybe like a couple timers, I'm talking very, uh, as far as electronics, a couple normal timers, the kind of timer you would hook up uh, to your air conditioner or something that you could buy in a hardware store, just a heavy duty timer. Um, they have simple ones and they have digital ones, um, a couple more watts there. And well, this is, uh, sorry, this is Leo. Uh, sorry, have you done a full um, uh, kind of load analysis of what your maximum load might, might, um, might be? The maximum load would be, um, well, let's see, let's go with the maximum amount of wattage for per light, six lights. So that's 3,600. So, so, I'm gonna stop you right there because I guess I guess all of this is uh, leading up to um, the fact that in the report, it says the proposed home occupation will likely entail additional demands on, on municipal water and sewer serving the property. The applicant has obtained a capacity letter from the Department of Public Works as required. I'm wondering whether you've talked at all with the um, with the uh, electrical department and and um, uh, seen whether whether this is a uh, a system that that they can handle. I have talked with the building inspector and uh, after my discussion with him, uh, yeah, he said that I should get a permit from the electrical department. I've talked to electricians, uh, two professional electricians who will, who have told me that the already, the system already at my house would support this, but they felt that it is likely 
that the, um, the electrical inspector would probably want an upgrade of service at the house. But that's something that I asked him to go do for me after we get through this step, that he would approach him and find out exactly what he would need because I felt like I would want an electrician on, on point on this so that I wouldn't, so that I would have a professional knowing exactly what, you know, is going to be needed and not have any guesswork. And then also have somebody that I'd already be working with uh, to do any potential construction. Uh, like I said, he felt that the, the already 100 amps uh, service at the house would be enough to handle the load of this electricity. Um, but he said he felt that it's likely because of the nature of the business and, uh, and um, the inspector probably wanting to go extra safe that yep. he would probably have us upgrade the service to 200 amps. Okay, thank you. I and guess the, I have... and the water department. I don't know if you if you wanted me to comment on that. I did get a letter of approval. I I explained everything in terms of water from them, and and they they didn't see any problem there at all. Sure, wonderful. I also had a question about the, the odor. I, I I I saw references to um, exhaust fans out of out of the tents. Is there also going to be a designated exhaust fan out of out of the basement, or uh, how do you? No. So, so the air, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering about um, kind of whether it's all going to circulate in on it itself. And um, that's the plan. Um, I know that that probably sounds, uh, it, it's really because of the size. Um, I think in a much bigger scale operation, it would be needed to vent that air out. But because I'm starting so small, um, I'm not going to need to do that. Um, part of my plan too is to to separate the the flowering cycle tents. There'll be two of them, and I'll run one. I don't know how much you guys know about the growing of cannabis, but like a flowering plant only needs light can only get light for 12 hours a day, or else you won't flower. So if you picture two tents that have the flowering plants in them. I'll run one on like, say, um, you know, just call it like noon to midnight and the other one midnight to noon. So the heat will, will it, for one, it'll help lower the heat during the hot times of the year, but during the cold times of the year, it'll help heat the basement when it's getting cold at night. So it kind of do both things. It's, it's not an ideal situation in terms of growing the best cannabis, but all I'm really trying to do, like I said, is, is get started on the business and build up so that I can get to that more professional situation. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. The, uh, yeah, so the, the, heat, the, the scrubbers will scrub the air and the air will just be in the house and will, you know, I guess get evacuated and just more like any normal air would get evacuated from a home. Um, I mean, in terms of odor, the scrubbers, uh, depending on the size you get, they'll last about six months to a year and you just get on a regular schedule of replacing them. And there really shouldn't be that much of a problem. And, you know, technically, you know, any resident in Burlington could be growing marijuana and yeah and also not use these scrubbers at all. And so sure. odor isn't really like necessarily, I think, un unfamiliar to residents of Vermont in general. <laughs> um, true. Uh, do you have in the application, I didn't see it, any, um, you know, if we ask somebody to have lighting plan, you know, when, when someone does conditional use for something with lighting, we often ask for lighting cut sheets and detail sheets about what's actually being used. And 
I hear your testimony about the use of the scrubbers and the tents, um, and I think that's important uh, mitigation. Do you have some detail sheets or some product examples that you could submit to us for part of the record that would show the scrubbers to be used? Um, sure. I I I haven't bought the equipment because I uh, don't want to invest in the equipment until I know that I'm proved. But I can certainly send samples of specifications on maybe two or three types of fans that I might, you know, there's just, there's different companies, there's different uh, lighting designs out there. And I don't know what I'll get yet, you know, kind of depending on availability and, and pricing and efficiency, things like that, you know, it, it will just kind of depend on when I actually buy them, what well specifically I'll have, but I could certainly research and get a couple likely scenarios for the type of equipment specifically. I think you'll find that they all fall within a, like a, a pretty reasonable similar range in uh, how they function and, and, and you know, the amount of electricity they'll use and all things like that. All of the electronics that you have listed or all be on the interior of the house, is that correct? Yes, the interior in the basement of the house. Yeah, because I, I don't know if this is a question for staff, but normally for lighting cut sheets and things, that's for exterior lighting where we typically have that requirement. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. The zoning standards are about out, outdoors. All the windows in the basement will be blocked. I mean, the lights will be in the tents. So that's technically only when I unzip the tents to work on the plants during their light cycle would any light even come out of the tents and then they have to be sealed up or else you mess up the cycle of the plant um but i i only have a couple windows that actually look into the basement and ever since i've lived in the house i've had those blocked with um some insulation just to reduce heat loss and i don't you know i'll cover i'll keep those i would keep those covered anyway so there's no light leakage out of the basement windows for sure. Can I, this is Jeff Hand. Um, one of the conditions that you're applying for a home occupation use for, so I think one of the implied if not explicit conditions is that you live at the house. Um, I just wanna make sure that's the case and that you understand you need to remain living there as a resident while you're using it for this operation. Oh, absolutely. This is uh, uh, my home. Uh, we purchased it uh, just over a year ago, uh, although I've been living in it for um, more than a decade as a renter. Um, okay. Great. Yeah, yeah it, it'll be predominantly a residence and it's our home. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm highly motivated to, to get out of the home in terms of this business and and make it just my house and not my work. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> so I also just wanna make a comment for staff so that I, I think it's important to say that. Um, this has come up, you know, cannabis cultivation is regulated under the municipal, under Title Seven, Section 869, cannabis cultivation is not farming and is regulated under Title 24. There's confusion to this point. Uh, small cultivators are, are, are in 2022, the legislature passed Act 158, which amended this general rule to say that certain types of small cultivators are exempt from municipal zoning regulation, but they have to be subject to the required agricultural practices on a farm. And so since this is not on a farm um, and not subject to the required agricultural practices, we have jurisdiction over it. Scott, is that the city in line position there? Yes, I'm impressed, AJ. It has to be on an existing farm outside and can't exceed a certain size. 
thousand uh, square feet. This is, this is inside and not on a farm. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to make that point because there may be people who look at this and wonder, well, hey, what's going on? So um, does the board have any more questions for the applicant? No? All right. Um, are there anyone in the audience to speak on this? I know we asked before and no one raised their hand. We've had a few more attendees show up. If you'd like right. to speak on this item, raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll move on. All right, nobody's raising their hand, AJ. Okay, well, with that, I'll close the public hearing on this item. So our next item is a certificate of appropriateness, 251-253 South Union, Daisy Property, Stephen Crendel, construction of five unit building addition, utilizing adaptive reuse of historic structure. Um, can I get everybody who wants to speak on this application to raise their hand? And do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury? You? Applicant, do you? And this rose. Oh. Hello? Hello. My You're on games. Yeah, my internet just glitched out ready to raise my hand, but I'm here. Okay. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury? I didn't hear a yes. I do. I didn't hear you. Okay. Um, and Steve Grinnell is also here if you have any questions about the architecture or design. All right. Um, well, tell us about your project. Uh, we talked about this at the hey, last. Hey, isn't this just here for the. Oh, yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, That's yeah. what I thought. I was confused for a second. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The transportation demand management. So we right. uh, we wrote a transportation demand management plan, submitted it. Uh, I was in touch with Annie of CarShare Vermont to work out uh, whether or not they would want a car share location at our building. They seem to indicate interest because apparently there's a lot of cars downtown, but not many in that area. So we have said that if there is demand from car share or desire from car share, we will support that certainly and place a car share spot on our building. Uh, and if we can do something electric there, we will uh, support electric charging there as well. Uh, and the other item was the inclusionary zoning. I've been in touch with Todd uh, and we have the spreadsheets or so we're passing the spreadsheets back and forth to figure out what the requirements will be. Does anybody in the board have any questions on the transportation demand management issue? Yes, there's a line. Parking will be unbundled from rent and made available at market rate. Um, uh, I think that's pretty straightforward. But 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 does that mean theoretically that 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 one person one unit could bid on two different parking spaces? Uh, I, I guess I'm not exactly sure how 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 that would work. Well, I don't think there's a, a bidding process, but I think we've got enough spots to justify the, the number of people that might be in the building, and we can certainly create a waiting list. It'll be first come, first serve, and yeah, somebody could have two spots if they really wanted them. We do have one three-bedroom apartment in the existing building. But if somebody had no spots, then they would not be paying additional rent for a parking spot they're not using. Right, okay. Um, any other questions? Anyone in the audience here to speak on this? Sorry, there was um, a line. Uh, there was a line in in the report. Note that use of these spaces by residents of this subject property will likely require an easement with the adjoining property for access. Um, do you have an easement? No, the easement that was in existence for the building was not uh, conveyed with title transfer, so we have to renegotiate that for the six spots that are on the north line of the property adjacent to the north property and access via the north property's driveway. 
uh, it seems like we will likely be able to do something, but there is no parking minimum. So I see. If we're not, it's not. I see. Yeah, I'm just going to ask that because that wasn't made clear when because the original application didn't have those spots in it and when you did the front building and then you put them back in when you did the addition, but it wasn't clear that those spots are ready for this project and not the building house next door. Um, so that yeah. was just your choice at this point is to use the spots there rather than trying to do it on your own property. Is that Right. All, all the spots that are on the current plan exist presently as paved area. Right, but are the spots that are not accessible on your from your property are they used for this lot or the lot next door right now? Uh, right now they're kind of just used by right now they're being used by contractors hmm. who are building the building as well as tenants to the north property. Again, who are they used for? Uh, right now, they're being used by contractors who are working on the renovation of the existing building, uh, as well as tenants of their property. We we haven't hammered out any sort of firm delineation. I think it would be nice to get that clarified, if not in the application, at least subsequently. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we have to have that clarified, but it's not in our jurisdiction. Showing parking spaces available for this project that in the end may not be available for this project. Right, right. It's like there's off-site parking. You know, there's no, there's no parking minimum on this project. So, opportunistically, we would like to add them to the project, but if we can't because of disagreements with our north neighbor, it has no impact upon uh, the viability of the project or its conformance to the code. So we, we have them currently in the plan, but we're happy to, if, if the DRB feels like it's necessary to uh, fully clarify that with uh, the zoning board before we get the pick up the, the build permit, we're happy to do so and clarify that. Uh, right now we have them in just to err on the side of the maximum lot coverage uh, and ensure that we would be conforming to maximum lot coverage. Uh, so, so removing them seems easier than adding them. Scott, is there any issue with the lot next door having parking spaces for off-site parking for another pro property? Um, it depends, but I'm going to say no, because parking minimums have been tossed and the regs in effect right now basically say you can share parking between properties. So do we feel like we need anything else? I don't. Anybody on the board? And nobody in the audience here to speak on this. I'll just confirm. It uh, looks like there are no ground-mounted uh, units. So everything is within the new structure. I'm sorry, new ground-mounted what? It, it appears that there are no new ground-mounted units. So like no condensers outside? Yeah, I think it's all gonna be in the structure. So nobody in the audience. All right, well, I see no hands up, Scott. You see no hands up. So with that, close the public hearing on this item. And that's our agenda for the night. Um, and with that, I'll close the board meeting for tonight. Uh,
approve. This is on uh, ZP22-540. To 17 Star Farm Road that we approve the application and adopt staff's findings and conditions. I'll second that. I, I, I was just looking at the um, conditions of approval and there isn't anything in the conditions approval that talk about odor. And do we want to have that? I mean, I, I know it's in the zoning regulations that are not supposed to but do we want to have that in the con in the conditions of approval that if there be no odors outside of the house from this operation? I mean, it is included in uh, under number seven under the special use regulations, conditional use reviews. It indicates that no home occupation shall create sounds, noise, dust, vibration. So do we need an additional condition that requires that if that's already? I, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Um. Perhaps because it's the first one. I mean, this is this is one of the first a uh, little bit of due of due diligence to to include it in the conditions. I think that I want to just says that as per the zoning regulations, there should be no odors outside of the house in this operation or something like that. I, I would accept that amendment. He does represent that in his application that it will not create odors or vapor vapors that will be detectable outside the immediate area of the basement. Okay, I'll agree with that. Okay. Part of that. So I'll agree with those conditions. Further discussion? All those in favor? All right. Passes unanimously. All right. Get to the beginning of this thing. There we go. On uh, ZP22540, no, that's not the right one. Sorry. Um, the right one. Uh, here we are. On uh, ZP, why do I keep ending up with the same one? Yeah, it's linked. It looks like the link is incorrect on the website to the uh, staff report. Ah, okay. On 251, 253 South Union Street whatever the ZP number is, I move that we approve the application, adopt staff's findings and recommendations. Second. All those in favor? All right, 